أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على عدائه مجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله جورنا وجوركم بمصاب النبي أبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام Just a follow on from yesterday We stated we cannot understand justice And we cannot confine God to being just This would be depriving God of his right and limiting God However, God can limit his own self So Allah says in Allah لَيْسَ بِذَلَّامٍ لِلْعَبِيدِ Allah does not oppress his creatures when we talk about justice and God not being oppressive, it has an impact on our outlook, on the way we organize ourselves in our own self. And these statements of God are to be seen in their existential capacity. If you look at the world of ours, it is in a fine balance. And this beautiful balance allows the world to evolve and to grow. Similarly, the human condition requires a balanced state between matter and between the mind between the spirit and between the body, between here and hereafter, between the individual and the family, between the family and the community, so on and so forth, between one religion and other religions. This is Adala playing its part fully. Now, when we stated that we can never understand Adala, it is true because we are always evolving and growing. We are of an evolutionary nature. What is just today may not be just tomorrow. That is the problem we at hand. In the Prophet's society, slavery was allowed. That was in accordance with justice. Today, slavery is inconceivable. It would be inconsistent with justice. Can you see this? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us, Allah ya'amuru bil adli wal ihsan. Allah commands with justice, and Ihsan, I'm going to explain this slightly as we go into today's lecture. What Allah says here by Allah commands with justice is that do not do unjust to anything. You will never understand the meaning of justice, but don't do injustice. So always look at the balance. And when you find inadequacies, bring it to par with balance and justice and righteousness. It might not constitute justice for tomorrow. But for today, you're understanding it is justice in an inverse manner. You will, your minds will understand what is unjust. Its contrary will be justice. Yes, that is as far as you can understand. But Allah says, do ihsan. What is ihsan? Ihsan means to give beyond the worth. This is what Allah says existentially. He who does good will have 10 times more. He who does good, falahu khairun minha, will have abundance good from it. This is the way of God and this is in existence. Let's explain this slightly and we need a different series of talks to explain these sort of spiritual themes and maybe that is a cue to somebody to invite me again here. Salawat. And if you don't give enough sadqa next time around, I'll be back. So if you look at things existentially, when we feel good about the world, what does she do? She responds to us in a befitting manner. When we are feeling nice within ourselves, when we have a positive outlook, the world tends to us in a positive manner. The Prophet was a very positive person. Not positive in the modern sense of positive thinking. Positive in his soul. He was very God-centric. He was in the folds of Ahsan, giving goodness to others and giving good opinion to others. What happened was that this goodness prevailed. Do you not see that when you are good to others, as the Quran says, the enmity will quickly change hands into friendship. 
repel evil by goodness, Allah says. But if you do evil, the evil's consequence will be curtailed to itself. You will only get equal amount of evil back. Because Allah says, Allah, Allah does not do injustice to creatures. The world of God does not allow this injustice. It's hardwired with this notion of not doing injustice to anybody. But when you do good to the world, she yields positively. And that is why we are told that when you are with your children, don't reprimand them and don't scold them. Be good to them and encourage goodness in them. This is what the Prophet did. The Muslim community today has drifted away from the ideals set by the Prophet. The Prophet looked at little good and he then worked on that little good to bring out a lot of good. He did not... Uh, <laughs> he did not focus on the negatives. If you constantly better somebody by reminding them of the wrongs that they have done, what happens? They will lose their confidence and they will become demonic. If I'm constantly told how evil I am, then the incentive to become good will be lost altogether. But if somebody tells me, look at how wonderfully you did this, what happens? It encourages me to a great deal of good. Now a teacher will always do this to the student. Don't say, look, leave the 10 exams that you failed. Look at this one that you've passed. There's a potential success story there. And if you pass, it's good for me as the educator because in your passing is my success that I'm a good instructor. Similarly, a parent is successful when children are good children. A community is successful when the congregation is good congregation. A religion is a good religion when the followers are godly creatures. A world is a good world when the Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala displays the Khilafah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is in the best interest of God that we succeed. And that is why God encourages little good to bring about great good. Let's give this example. If I need a promise from all of you. I'm intending to finish these lectures, the main themes, yes, by Saturday night, but it won't complete. So please do make sure you attend on Monday as well, yes, so we can conclude the whole series. Because I know Imam Hussein is for 10 days, and on the 11th day, it's only the Maulana. Yeah? So let us keep Imam Hussein you know, with us on the 11th as well and on the 12th, all right. So. The worst thing is not being able to complete the topic. That's the worst thing ever. Yes, so inshallah we can complete it properly. So, and that's why I can just focus a little bit more on, on, on this explanation. So somebody, and you've heard this on so many occasions, the law of alcohol, prohibition of alcohol came, it came steadily from Surah Baqarah, from Medina onwards, right? Now somebody came to the Prophet and he said, ah, Ya Rasulullah, I can't stop alcohol. Now imagine somebody has been the nerve and the guts to say this to the Prophet, I can't stop alcohol. <laughs> you know, it's like somebody coming to the Mullah and I can't stop cigarettes, for example. So I don't smoke. So the Prophet... I don't want to go into my personal life at all, so we'll focus on the, uh, on the subject at hand. So the prophet looked at him and said, well, what can you stop for me? Then tell me, there must be something else you can do for me instead of alcohol. So the prophet did not reprimand him. How dare you? Allah has said this. Look at you. The prophet's best interest is what? That I bring about godliness in this creature in his own limitation. So that man said, I'm just going to narrate this story. It's a beautiful story. That that man says, I lie as well. So the Prophet said, is it easier to stop lying for you? He said, of course, I'll stop lying. I won't give up alcohol. The Prophet said, okay, do that for me. So next time around, he meets the Prophet. The Prophet said, what happened? He said, I stopped alcohol. He said, what? How come? He said, because I promised you that I will not lie. Every time I had a drink, people would ask me, what have you done? And because I couldn't lie, I had to tell them that I have consumed alcohol. The embarrassment of it got so much, they had to give it up. Little good is like a ray of light in the midst of dire, utter darkness. What does that ray of light do? It tears it apart. It only needs a ray of light to tear apart darkness. And that is why goodness is worked on. And this was the method of the Prophet, and this is what Allah says. In Allah, ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Ihsan, what is ihsan? To beautify things. What really ihsan means is to give more than what is deserved. The prophetic hadith about Ihsan is this, that worship Allah as if you see Allah. 
even if you don't see Allah, Allah sees you. That is the definition of Ahsan. But when we look at closely the definition of Ahsan in Islam, the way the Prophet gave and the way the Imams practice, Ahsan means to beautifully, for the sake of God, to make every act godly. So when somebody does wrong to me, my response has to be one that a Khalifa of Allah should offer in place of Allah. What does Allah do? He is Rahman and Rahim, isn't he? So the Khalifa of Allah is supposed to offer a response of Ahsan far more than what is deserved by the recipient. Doesn't Allah give us far more than what we deserve? How much do we deserve of this ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Look at the foolish minds we are. We value gold and silver and diamonds, don't we? But tell me the most valuable thing is what? The air that we breathe. And the next one is water that we drink. The most valuable commodities that we have through which life is sustained at every instance are those things that we don't even recognize. If God really wanted us to fall into prostration, what would he do? He would have some form of outage of air. Yes, then he would bring about curfew or shortage of air that from this minute to this minute you will not breathe. But Allah is Mahsin. He loves Ahsan. So Ahsan means to encourage goodness and to bring about goodness in the most beautiful way that is befitting. So that is the system of God. So when the Prophet came, he did nothing but Ahsan. The people who had buried six daughters, what did he say to them? He said, start afresh. Those people went away crying and lamenting. And then they became the best of people. Do you know that? I always say this, that my job is to curse the ISIS. Prophet's job is to make them into finest humans. That's the difference between me and the Prophet. The Prophet comes to monsters and makes them into finest humans. People like me come to find humans and we make them into distorted monsters because of the Islam that we have understood. So when we talk about Ahsan, we are not talking about justice. We are saying that we can never understand justice. We have to go a level beyond as the Khalifa of Allah. Now we come to the article of faith that is prophethood. Now, we can't really prove and substantiate the prophet's prophethood. It has to be done through miracles, yes? So it's an indirect way. The prophet's miracle is the Quran. So we have to talk over the Quran. The point of the Quran is the most disturbing point. It is the book that is a communication from God which brings about a godly community and it is the book that is driving a community of people who subscribe to it to the pits of destruction. It's the Quran that has driven us to our destruction today, isn't it? Everybody is a kafir. Everybody is going to hell. Everybody is nudges. We can plunder, we can cheat. Everything is justified through the Quran, isn't it? The ISIS take Yazidi girls as slaves. It's a barbaric, inhumane, monstrous act. But where is it justified? From the Quran. Waging war from the Quran. But I ask these people, oh you who read the Quran and bring, bring about this monstrosity. The Quran was there to reform people. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is nothing but goodness. Allah is the promoter of life. Allah produces and encourages production and productivity. Where do you see in the world of God any destruction? Even if there is a volcanic eruption or a tsunami, it is only there to accommodate greater level of growth. Show me one instance in this beautiful creation of God where there is destruction not accompanied by greater growth. The story with Allah and Allah's creation is different. Death is an agency for greater life. Don't you see this? Calamity is an agency for growth of the human intellect and mind, intellectually, morally, and spiritually. There is nothing but productivity and growth in the world of God and encouraged by the Quran. How can the people who read the Quran as a book from God be so destructive and brutal and merciless? It shows here that something has gone amiss and something has gone wrong. It's an article of faith. 
the prophet's prophethood is contingent upon the truthfulness of the Quran. Once the Quran is truth, the prophet's prophethood is verified. So let us look at the Quran and what it is, what is happening. As I said, if I don't finish my lectures, you will be attending after they're finished. That's the 10 days. And that's the promise I've taken of all of you here. And be true to your promise. Even though most of you have not nodded your heads. The assumptions of the Quran are the things that are very naive in our minds. These are the assumptions. The Quran is eternal. Although the place I'm going to deal with this topic thoroughly will be in the lectures that will be inshallah delivered on the topic of how to understand the Quran. The meta-exegetical principles of the Quran. I'll deliver these talks fully there. And next year in Canada on Islam and pluralism. These talks will be delivered more fully there. But for the requirement of this series only. Quran is eternal. It is absolute. It is universal. These are the notions we have about the Quran, don't we? And that Quran is to be understood in its literal sense. Yes? These are the things that we understand about the Quran, don't we? So in that, they boil down to certain few assumptions that Quran is eternal forever. It is universal, it applies to everyone, and it is to be understood in its literal capacity. These are the three main assumptions of the Quran that we have. Yes? Today, anybody will say, this is in the Quran, this is not in the Quran. Yes? As if it applies universally. It is the word of God till the day of Qiyamah. True? And it is to be understood literally. So according to this, the ISIS are not wrong in taking slaves. Because slavery is not banned in the Quran. Can you see this? It is eternal, applicable universally, yes, to all regions, and it is to be understood literally. Yes? According to this, therefore, there have to be two female witnesses to one male witness. Agreed? According to this, therefore, the inheritance has to be the way the Quran has described it. Yes? According to these assumptions, therefore, we have a lot of problems. And on top of that, you will be faced with the problem of sex slaves as well. Forgive me for being so harsh and brutal from the pulpit, but I suppose this is the only way to redress an age-old problem that's in our heads. Now, if we take these things literally, we are forced back into a primitive state, into a state that we ourselves are shunning today in Iraq when the ISIS are doing it, aren't we? We are saying this is barbaric what the ISIS are doing. But at the same time, they are saying it's in your Quran. And again then, we will have this notion that all of the Christians and the Jews and everybody is condemned to hell. Yes? And do not take them as friends or associates. Then we are not supposed to have any dealings with them. This is the end result of these assumptions. So now I ask you, on the one hand, the Muslim, as an article of faith, is taking on the Quran. On the other hand, the assumptions relating to this book of God is forcing a Muslim into a state of life that is totally inconsistent with what they know to be the truth. So now they have to believe in something that they themselves are shunning. Can you see this? And here we have a problem. I will say this. The Quran is eternal. I agree. The Quran is absolute. I agree. The Quran is, I will say this, to be understood in the literal sense. Fine. The only thing that is misunderstood is that the Quran is also contextual. And this is the thing that the Muslims need to understand. The context of the Quran. Now, if you were to say the Quran is eternal in essence, and temporal in its form. The Quran is absolute in its essence, but relative in its application and its form. Then everything comes together once again. Now let us explain this properly. If you look at the human community, the human community, as I often use this word, is an evolutionary truth. The existential truth is an evolutionary truth. From the time of Adam till now, what have we done? We have evolved. We have grown. We have acquired more sophistication. 
And this is no different from the evolutionary growth of a child. The child will grow from the cradle to the ripe old age. At every point, we will teach the child certain salient truths and other things that are formed on those salient truths that keep on changing. That is the way it is. We say to the child, don't lie. Don't lie will remain the truth till the end of life. We will teach the child, be charitable. That will remain the, remain the truth. We will tell the child, pray to Allah. That will remain the truth. But how do you pray will keep on changing as the child progresses? Today, make a little prayer before going to bed. Tomorrow, read a little bit of Quran. Day after that, do a bit of tasbih. Day after that, do namaz. Day after that, go and do amal. That will change. But the prayer aspect will never change. Relate to God. Say the truth. But you can shout and say the truth if you're a little ch child. But when you are an adult, you can't shout. Say the truth calmly. When you're a child, you can fight and say the truth. Now you're an adult. You don't engage in debates. It's below you. You are a scholar. Engage in discussion. It's befitting for you. So what is the same and what is changing? The salient, eternal truths are the same. The way in which it is packaged in accordance with evolutionary trend is changing. Similarly, if you look at the Quran, and please listen to this carefully, the Quran talks about kitab, 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 kitab. We gave Musa the kitab, we gave Isa the kitab, we gave you the kitab. What is the kitab? The Quran says, kitab fi. This book or that book. I mean, even if we say that, it reduces to this because we're talking about the Quran. But Quran's emphasis is on the book. That the book came as Torah. Book came as Injil. Book came as Quran. Now Allah SWT says, Bal huwa Quranun majid fi lohin mahfud. It is the Quranun Majid in the sacred vault. In the sacred vault, not anywhere else. Allah says, Innuhu la Quranun Katim Quranun Karim fi kitabin maknoon. It is the Quranul Karim in the guarded tablet. That none can touch except the most purified. And that purified, we say, is the intellect of the Prophet and his descendants. But if you look at the Quran, the Quran is talking about one salient reality known as Kitab. And that Kitab is expressing itself time and again as different books. So the same Kitab is saying it's Torah. The same Kitab is calling itself Injil. The same Kitab is calling itself Quran. At different levels of progression, the same kitab is giving itself different names and different expressions. Now, tell me, the book of Moses did not have the fast of Ramadan. The book of Isa did not have the fast of Ramadan. The book of Rasulullah has the fast of Ramadan. Yes? The book of Moses did not have the five prayers. The book of the Prophet has five prayers. The book of Moses did not have Hajj. The book of the Prophet has Hajj. Allah says in the Quran, I gave them their Sharia. I have given you your Sharia in the Quran. I gave them their manasik of Hajj. And then whatever they did, I give you your manasik. I gave them their rituals of sacrifice. I'm giving you your rituals of sacrifice. He's saying, I've done the same for them. I've done the same for you. I will say, Allah, then what is changing? Why did you reveal a different book? Why was the book revealed in a different way? Think about this carefully. What changed from Musa to Isa? Did lying become permissible? Did cheating become permissible? Did killing become permissible? Did ungodliness become permissible? None of them. Whatever Moses said was what Jesus said was what the last prophet said. The salient truths have always been the same. Speak the truth. Value life. Be charitable. Do not cheat. Do not kill. Do not plunder, do not exploit, do not demean the other. All these beautiful godly sentiments are carried forward in every revelation. What has changed? The packaging of it has all changed. Can you not see this? There was a punishment of that in the Torah. Yes? In the Torah, 
there was high level of punishment of death stoning to death and this to that and anybody found doing going on the holy mountain was put to death whatever they were killing people left right and center Jesus came they brought a woman to her and they said look she is guilty of fornication Isa salamullah alayhi looked at the floor and he was writing something then he looked up he said lest he who has not sinned cast the first stone everybody left but still it's in the scripture of Isa when Rasulullah came the Quran does not have any punishment of death at all what has changed we have grown so those salient truths have been packaged differently you can scold a child but you will not go and indig undignify a grown man by telling them off you will reason with them in the time of Moses they were stoned to death in the time of the prophet he understood that these people are noble creatures i can no longer stone them to death there is no verse of stoning to death in the quran there is no verse of killing anybody in the quran for any crime do you know this so now let us carry on that the thing that is true and salient has remained salient throughout the thing that has changed has been the packaging has changed that is what we are not understanding and the book is a different reality altogether now i will ask a question before we go further into our analysis that the kitab is something else and quran is something else yes now in quran we have abrogation don't we verses of the quran are cancelling verses of the quran aren't they if they are eternal and universal and applicable to all time then why is one verse cancelling the other verse and both of them are in the quran both of them are eternal both of them are universal and yet one cancels the other one how do you make sense of that only within the evolutionary track that that level of law was needed at that point as a community matured another level of law came and cancelled the first one it's still eternal in essence but the form has been moved i ask you from the time of the prophet muhammad till now has the human community evolved or not today we will say slavery is not allowed but the claim of eternity in the way that we understand does not allow it it is eternal in essence the packaging of that eternal sentiment might be temporal now let us go in there in this in nanzalna ilayk al kitab bil haqq we have revealed the book to you o muhammad in truth yes so the book has been revealed to you fine tanzil al kitab min al ghafur al hakim min al aziz al hakim revelation of the book from the aziz the mighty the hakim the wise tanzil min al rahman al rahim kitab fusilat ayatuhu quran al arabian li qaumin ya'qilun aw ya'lamun it's a revelation from the rahman and rahim of a book whose verses have been separated as quran so the book has been given in the form of the quran arabian in an arabic language which shows that arabic is not essential to the quran it has been revealed the book has been revealed in arabic for the people who understand just as it was revealed in another language before it the book is a mighty reality that is revealed in the form of the quran you see this so the eternal truth carried in torah in jil is the same eternal truth carried in the quran hamim wal kitab al mubin hamim and the apparent book inna ja'alnahu quranan arabian we made it we made the book into an arabic quran so the arabic quran is a reflection of the book the book is another reality a grand reality that is reflected in the quran can you see this so here the essence is eternal essence is eternal the form in change hamim wal kitab al mubin inna anzalna hu fi laylatin mubarakatin hamim and the apparent book we have caused it to be revealed in a blessed night now i will ask you a simple question before we go into this further Allah says there is no dry there is no wet say it is in the kitabul mubin that it is in the kitabul mubin so our assumption is everything is in the quran right i often say this and you must have heard me where is the banana in the quran where is the kangaroo in the quran tell me the quran has to talk about those things that people relate to if a verse of kangaroo would have come the arabs would have said what is it going on about but the verse of elephant has come because they could relate to it right the verse of giraffe hasn't come the verse of camels have come talking about the camel but you don't get aeroplanes in the quran or tractors we don't get these things do we 
So when you say everything is inside the apparent book, then I ask you, where is it in the Quran? You will have to then admit or find a very good explanation, then I'll be convinced. Kitabul Mubin is a reality in itself that reveals itself in accordance with given contexts in which there is a salient existential principle and truth, but it is packaged differently. Now, look at this verse that Surah Baqarah was revealed. It was the first surah to be revealed in Medina within a pluralistic context. In the description of the Muttaqeen, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ And those people who believe in everything that is revealed to you and revealed before you. Now, if there was inconsistency between the Quran and Torah and Injil, why would they believe in everything that was revealed previously? If I can say we believe in everything revealed to us and everything that was revealed before us, what does that mean? That there is full consistency. Otherwise, I will not believe it, right? Unless there was full consistency. But I'm saying I believe in everything that's revealed to us and everything revealed before us shows that it's one and the same thing. It's the same book. The only thing that has changed is that it has changed the application of those salient truth. So in essence, all the revelations are the same. In form, they are different. I'm not talking about distortions that have occurred. I'm talking about in essence. You might say that the Torah is distorted. I will then bring a counter argument and say even if it is distorted, the moral and the spiritual truths are the same. Yes? Because Allah says in the Quran, the Jews and the Christians are upon nothing until they apply the Torah and the Injil. So why would Allah say to them to apply the Torah and the Injil? If that is a distorted book that they have in their hands. So now, how do we resolve these problems? On the one hand, the Quran says, do not take the Jews and the Christians as friends. Now we say here, that this is inconsistent with our human condition. What's wrong with them? Why should we not take them as friends? It shows that there is something wrong with our understanding. And two, when the Quran praises the Christians, like it praises the Christians, their eyes flood with tears, they spend all night long in the worship of Allah, reading the signs of Allah and doing sajda, you will find the people who love you the most are those who are Christians, because in them are priests and monks. Then there is a conflict in the Quran. You see this? So it is here we say, well, what is happening? Every group of person who is taking a verse, they're taking it with the notion of eternity of the form. In its literal sense. Without contrasting this verse and saying that there is context. The context determines the first interpretation of the Quran. So now, that verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the punishment of the enemy of God is that they be killed or banished. I will ask you, there was a context for the revelation of this verse. Let us look at the context in order to understand what the verse says. Otherwise, if you don't want to look at the context, then in that case, tell me who is the enemy of God. Have you understood? Anybody who is not a Muslim, is there, are they an enemy of God? Really, is that what you're understanding? In any case, the context of this verse, as I've explained in previous lectures, Elsewhere, it was that, that there was a group of people who claimed themselves to be Muslims. They ambushed a caravan. They got their people and they cut them. They actually brutally, barbarically, not only murdered them, but dismembered their bodily organs, their, their limbs. So in response to this incident against the so-called Muslim, this verse had come, the enemy of God. It includes only that instance. And whoever fits in those sort of instances... And I think the people who ambushed were Muslims. So Allah is calling Muslims the enemy of God here. It's not to be applied universally. It has a context of its own. So now, if we look at the existential nature, we find two types of context. One context is created through our growth and evolution in the vertical. And the other type of context is created through the horizontal relativity. Every region on earth is different. And every era is different to the preceding era. There is two types of relativities there. Two types of contexts are immediately imposed upon us. You see this. Now, as I said, if I don't finish, then you will have to bear with me and come back. Yes. So now, 
If you look at the verses that say that do not take befriend Jews and Christians, look at the context. You will find that the Jews and Christians were conspiring against the Muslims at that point. If you look at the context, then in that case, in today's world, that Jew and Christian could change hand with Muslim easily. If a group of Muslims are conspiring against the greater body, then do not take them as friends. In essence, the form is determined by the context. So that has no universality to it. So now, I'm just going to put one obvious verse here. The verse that we quote about pluralism, I always say this, that if anybody is sincere, genuinely sincere, throwing away all ego and arrogance, and they embark upon the search for finding God, whether they reach Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they are all in the fold of greater Islam. And they will all have salvation. Allah is saying blatantly this thing twice in the Quran and in many other places, not so blatantly. In Alladina Amanu, Walladina Hadu, Wan Nasara, Was Sabi'in, Man Amana Billah, Wal Yomil Akhir, Wa Amala, Saliha. The believers, Jews, the Christians, the Sabians, amongst them, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not even sparing the believer. He says, amongst the believers, whoever, amongst the Jews, whoever, amongst the Christians, whoever, and amongst the Sabians, or whoever. So the Jews, Christian, Sabian, Muslim title doesn't mean anything to God. That's the first thing. Can you see that? The title of Islam, the title of Christianity, the title of Judaism, the title of Sabian, doesn't mean anything to God. He says from these four groups, whoever believes in Allah. So what does that show? There is a belief beyond Islam. There is a belief beyond Christianity, Judaism, and Sabianism. Isn't there? Whoever amongst the Sabians believes in Allah. So it shows that whoever within a formal group sincerely yields to Allah and understands the hereafter and a sense of responsibility and then performs righteous deeds. And we will explain this in the next lectures that righteous deeds means what? It means how we grow through knowledge and through devotion coming to the fullness of our existence and that is the meaning of salvation. That certificate in which the teacher writes pass is not pass, pass is what's in the head of the student that he was transmitted on the exam paper. That pass mark is only a reflection of what the student has done. Paradise is only a reflection of what you and I are doing. Paradise is not like a pass mark. The pass mark is indicative of what the student has in them. The paradise is indicative of what we have become within ourselves. So whoever amongst the Muslims, the Christians, the Jews, the Sabians, whoever amongst these formal groups believes in Allah, the last day and does righteous deeds, they will have their paradise finished. This is what Allah is saying. And if sincerely for the sake of Allah, somebody has become a Sunni, then they are on salvation. If sincerely somebody has become a slave of Allah and they are Shia, they have their salvation. Don't you see this? And if a Sunni knows that Imam Ali was the first Imam and then denies it, then that is problematic. Can you see this? If a Christian knows that the Prophet Muhammad has come and is the final prophet and then denies it, then that is kufr. But before that it is not kufr. So now, this verse is contrasted by another verse. Now I want you to listen to this carefully. قَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Fight the people who do not believe in Allah and they do not believe in the final day. وَلَا يُحَرَّمُونَ مَا حَرَّمَ اللَّهِ And they do not make haram what Allah has made haram and His Prophet has made haram. وَلَا يُرِيدُونَ دِينَ الْحَقِّ And they do not abide by the right religion. مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ From the people who have been given the book. So it's the Jews and the Christians. So somebody will say to me, what about this verse? I will say, have you read the verse accurately? It says, from amongst the people of the book who do not believe in Allah and His Messenger. And that verse was saying from the people of the book who believe in Allah. Sorry, this verse is saying amongst the people of the book who do not believe in Allah and in the last day. And that verse was saying the people from the book who believe in Allah in the last day. It means that many Muslims do not believe in Allah in the last day. The people who killed Hussein ibn Ali did not believe in Allah and the last day even though they were Muslims. Does that make sense? person 
who struck the sword on the head of Ali ibn Abi Talib was not a Muslim despite being a Muslim. Because he did not believe in Allah in the last day. We are talking about the people of the book and the people of the Quran who believe in Allah beyond the formal Islam that we give lip service to. So when you look at these verses, you will find no conflict in them. You will find that they are in different context. They can reconcile. Now if you look at the Quran accurately, what does Allah say? لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Finish. Or Rasulullah, despite the majority of the people becoming Muslims, he says they will not believe. Finish. Allah does not hesitate to declare the Muslim kafir inside the Quran. He does not hesitate to declare the Muslim mushrik in the Quran. He does not hesitate to declare the Muslim munafik inside the Quran. There are two levels we are talking about, the formal and the inner. Whoever is sincere and wherever they stop, in the journey of sincerity towards Allah, genuinely, they are in a state of greater Islam. Now, if we look at the Quran properly, in its proper existential capacity, in its proper context, then it makes full sense. But if we go with the naive assumptions of the Muslims, then the Muslim can never be the agent of God or the Khalifa of God on the face of this earth because what he believes to be revelation bars him from the khilaf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by immediately imposing biases on his mind. But that is nothing to do with the book of Allah. It is to do with the limitation of the understanding of the people. Somebody went to Imam Sadiq salamu alayhi. And he said, this book is strange. Every time I read it, it has a newer meaning. You know what the Imam responded? He said the Quran's meaning renews itself with every era. That's the beauty of the Quran. It is an eternal book in the sense that the essence always refashions itself with every new different era. And that is how the Imams taught us to interpret the Quran. When Imam Hussein was coming to Karbala, well to Kufa, and then of course he was intercepted and he came to Karbala and said, Holy prepared to battle against the Imam. His wife said, where do you go? He said, to fight against Hussein. She was a believer. She said, but Hussein is the grandson of the Prophet of Allah. He is the Lord of the youth of paradise. How can you put Hussein to that? Holy reported, at that point he read a hadith. He said, whoever stands against the Khalifa of the time, the Prophet has said, put them to death. Now, first and foremost, such a hadith does not exist, let's say. Even if it did exist, the understanding is in essence that whoever stands against righteous khalif with a false claim, put them to death. It does not mean put Hussein ibn Ali to death who is the real khilafa and the khalif of Allah and the Prophet. This is what this sort of literalistic understanding does. It drives us to this pitiful end and to this calamity in the name of the most noble one. When today the people say that, you know, there is Islam, there's something wrong with it, instead of shying away, you know, we should say, let us look into it. Let us see what is, according to you, wrong. At least entertain that criticism. At least look into it because then we can unravel it and we can be guided a right to a greater sense of right, much greater sense of right. And we understand this glorious book in the fullest sense of what it means. We go to Karbala. We find throughout the journey, Bibi Zainab filled with anguish. It's amazing the way she was. She is preoccupied with her Hussein. She cannot understand a life without Hussein. We find an incident on the night of Ashura. Imam Hussein awoke abruptly from his sleep. And he said, Inna lillahu inna ilayhi rajiun. And then he recited poetry or time. Oh, be unto you as a friend. How many have awoken in your lap as comrades. Only for you to place them beneath the earth before nightfall. When she heard this, she slapped her face and she cried and lost consciousness. 
She could not bear the thought of the death of her brother. So what do we find with Lady Zainab? We find her constantly spurring the people of Imam Hussein to support Imam Hussein. To find greater numbers of supporters. Lady Zainab, it's amazing. Akbar has fallen from his teeth. Sheikh Abbas says that when Hussein appears, he finds a woman wailing. Hussein asks, O oh maid of God, who may you be? Lamenting at the body of my youthful son. She said, Oh brother, I am your sister. We ask her, Why did you do this? She responds, I knew that that wound in the chest of Akbar would take the life out of my Hussein. And I wanted to become a veil between Hussein and his Akbar. We find her defiant, not letting and wanting her, husband, her brother to die. When death became imminent, you know what she said. She said, oh brother, in whose care do you leave me? I have no grandfather, father, or brother. This is Zainab. Battle breaks out in the morning. In the beginning, entirety of the forces engaged with each other. When the numbers of Imam Hussein dwindled and none but his close family and companions were left, it was an Arab tradition that battle be conducted a single combat. One person from the side of Imam Hussein would go and one person from the other side would come. But the treachery of that side was that without being able to withstand the blows of the side of the Imam Hussein, it would surround that one individual and put them to death. But since the name numbers in the camp of Imam Hussein were so few, he had to send them one by one. Zainab looks at her two children. He says, Oh, Muhammad, what is it that you intend? Do you not wish to give your lives? Shall I see Hussein being killed and you still being alive? Why do you hesitate? They tearfully say, Oh, mother, we go to our uncle. Whenever he looks at us, he turns his face and begins to weep. What may we do, O oh mother? He says, Fiza, go to my brother. Ask him to come to me. Fiza goes to Hussein. He understands. He refuses. The Zakirin say that Zainab sends another message. O oh son of my mother. Do you wish to see your sister appear before you? And he hears this. He comes to the tent. When he comes to the tent, Imam Hussein does not look at Zainab in her eyes. He says, oh brother, look at me. When Hussein looks at Zainab, he says, oh Hussein, what shall I respond to our mother Fatima on the day of Qiyamah? But what about Abdullah or Zainab? What face shall you show to him if they are killed? Oh, Hussein, you understand not. Abdullah gave them to me for you. He said, if battle breaks out, send them to for the help of Hussein and let them be killed. Hussein reluctantly gives permission. We find this in Maktal. Zainab has brought new garments with her. She dresses them into new, in the new garments. She combs their hair and cleans them. Which mother have you seen that sends her children to death as grooms? Go, oh children, go. Zainab takes, takes to the prayer mat. Fiza stands. At the door of the tent, they come to Hussein. Hussein prays for them. Abbas causes them to ascend upon their steeds. They are little on in Muhammad. Hussein sends them. 
Abbas and Hussein stand upon a small hill watching the two children. Zainab has said to them, Khawun and Muhammad, if you find Umar ibn Sa'ad, behead him. If you find yourself at the water, do not drink. The children are going. Umar ibn Sa'ad asks, who are these? What are they doing in the battlefield? They are too young to fight. They are the children of Zainab. I stand perplexed at the love this sister has for her brother. Sending the apples of her eyes to the battlefield. The children engage in their battle. Fizza looks at Hussein and Abbas. The children are fighting. They kill a great many number. Umar ibn Sa'ad says, surround them and finish them off. They surround them. Muhammad is struck upon his head. As Muhammad is struck upon his head, he descends upon the plains of Karbala. On rushes to Muhammad and says, Oh Muhammad, fear not my dear brother. I too shall join you very shortly. Muhammad fights and Muhammad is put to death. When this happens, Hussein can no, no longer bear his grief. He sits down upon the hill. As he sits upon the hill, Fizza turns towards Zainab. As she turns towards Zainab, Zainab places her head within Sajda. Hussein dorte hai maktal mein. Hamid ibn Muslim farmate hai. کہ لاشیں اتنے نازک ہیں کہ حسین دونوں لاشوں کو ہاتھوں میں لیتے ہیں اور اس طرح سے واپس لے آتے ہیں کہ سینے حسین کے بغل میں ہیں اور پیر خط کھینچتے جا رہے ہیں زمین کربلا پر جب کبھی بھی حسین لاشوں کو لے کر آتے تھے واپس تو زین اب سب سے پہلے آتی تھی استقبال کرنے کے لیے اب کی جب حسین آئے تو ہر ایک بیوی آئی ہے بجز زینب کے زینب نظر نہیں آ رہی حسین کو ہم پوچھتے ہیں اس کی وجہ کیا ہے زینب کہتی ہے عباس کمی کہتے ہیں کہ زینب یہ نہیں چاہتی تھی کہ حسین کو شرمندگی ہو زینب کو دیکھ کر گیارہویں محرم ہے حمید ابن مسلم روایت کرتا ہے میں گیا مقتل میں بے سر لاشے تھے روندے ہوئے ہر لاشے پر کوئی نہ کوئی تھی بین کرنے والی رونے والی دو ایسے ننے جنازے مجھے نظر آئے ہیں جس پر کوئی رونے والا نہ تھا میں نے پوچھا کیا یہ لا وارث تھے ان کی کوئی ماں نہ تھی خبردار ہے مسلم یہ زینب کے صاحبزادے ہیں تو زینب کہاں ہے اپنے بھائی کے لاشے پر ملے گی دوڑے حمید اے دختر پیغمبر کیا آپ نے بچوں پر دو آنسو نہیں بہاؤ گی کہا اے حمید حسین کے نام پر صدقہ کر دیا ہے میں نے بچوں کو ماتم حسین جب رن میں آئے حیدر و جعفر 
के माल का और बेकसों पे टूट पड़ी फौज किया 